gradual increase in rates, but an increase nonetheless. Um, the Bank of China um, raised it, a bunch of its overnight rates. So we're seeing this incremental raise in rates. The Bank of Japan, they actually remained on hold with rates flat, but given that they have generally been cutting rates along with these other central banks for the last eight years, um, the fact that they were on hold um, is similar to the other banks cutting, let's say something like that. Um, why does this matter? Why do these rate hikes, um, why is this such a big deal? Um, one way to look at it is we can just look at the math. That's what I'm going to look at today. I hope I don't put any of you to sleep with this. Um, but I think the best way to illustrate it is just using some of the numbers um, to show it. If we can go to my first slide. Yeah. So what I show here is a very basic valuation model, probably the simplest valuation model there is. What it assumes is that there's a company generating... Um, 100 units of whatever dollars or baht or whatever market it is of um, cash flow, and that the interest rates forever are 5%. So you've got cash flows forever into the future of 100, and you've got interest rates on hold at 5%. The reason we use 5% as a basic number is because um, generally interest rates on average over history have averaged somewhere between 3 and 5%. Um, if you look at that basic model, you take 100 and you divide it by 5%, you have a value of 2,000 units. Um, now, if you can go to the next slide, what I want to show you is what happened. Last time we had 5% interest rates was like 10 years ago. Um, so what's happened is interest rates have come down and down and down. What happens if cash flows remain the same um, while these interest rates are falling? You can see it on this second slide. Cash flows are 100, like our previous slide. But now the interest rate has dropped to 1%. Now you can see the value has jumped from 2,000 units to 10,000 units. Um, so a pretty substantial jump just by, lowering the in, just by lowering these interest rates. That's why it's such a fundamental factor. Now we could go to even more of an extreme example. If we go to the next slide, where we drop the rates to 0.1%. Now that seems pretty extreme. Interest rates are almost zero. But what we've seen in the last two years, that's actually happened we've gotten even negative rates. So not just zero, but negative. Um, so when you get to these incredibly low rates, the value shoots up massively, assuming the cash flows stay the same. Um, and what we've seen in the markets is not a whole lot of growth in that top part of the equation. In that 100, if you look at the last year, last eight years, we haven't seen an incredible increase in growth. It's been okay, but the decline in the interest rates has been way more severe than the increase in the cash flows. So if you look at this extreme example, we've got a value of 100,000. I mean, imagine we started originally at 2,000. So we've had this huge increase just by lowering the interest rates. So you can see the problem is if we've come down to zero rates and now we're starting to go back up, we've got an issue because the thing's gonna work in reverse. We're gonna go from our 0.1% interest rate valuation of 100,000 and as interest rates go up, we're going to head back to our valuation of 2000. Now, these are extreme examples to make a point. But what I'm saying is um, this is something we have to look at. And this is why. Why do these rates matter? It matters because of this math, because of this basic valuation math. Everyone looks at all the assets all over the world and does these numbers. And that's what happens. Now, what you could say, the argument that's going on right now is that the top line, the 100 that we saw in those models, that that is increasing. So even though the interest rate is going to rise, the cash flows on the top are also going to rise and offset that. Um, we need to see what really happens in the next year. There's a lot of promise going on now, um, but we're not seeing too much delivery in terms of increase in, that, in that, um, the top of, of that equation. Um, so that's rate hikes um, in context using the math. Um, it'll allow you to see if you see further rate hikes in all these markets that you should assume, unless you see that cash flow, that 100 on the top, go up a lot, you can expect that asset prices should tend to come down a bit. Okay, so that is rate hikes. Um, the second thing I want to look at is, do we have any any 
questions, comment, or anything? Yeah, nothing. Um, the second thing we want to look at today is market valuations. Um, if you go to my next slide, the index performance slide. Yeah, so where, where have we come in the last year? Um, since 2016. So we've got the U.S. market, the S&P 500 is up 27%. Um, Europe and Hong Kong up around the same level, 100, uh, 14%, 13%. So what we've seen is, it, is a huge increase, especially in the last um, six months since the election, an extra jump where the, the U.S. has definitely um, soared above the rest of the world. Um, I'm a bit concerned about that in the U.S., uh, less concerned about the valuations in, in Europe and um, Hong Kong. I think those valuations are not excessive at this point. Um, I want to explain another um, concept, which I call the hope versus reality. So when we look at these, when we look at this index performance, how much of that is actual earnings growth, and how much of that is just people expecting higher earnings growth in the future? So I call this the hope versus reality model. I'm going to do a little bit more math. Um, I'll get some feedback um, after this on whether you guys like all this math. I can cut it out. I can make it more in depth or whatever you like, um, depending on what people are thinking. Um, but I think it helps explain things um, a lot, these simple models, um, with a few numbers. Okay, so the next slide we want to go to, uh, we're there on EPS growth. Okay, this is what I call reality. Um, so one of the main metrics that all of you probably look at when you're um, doing valuation is the price to earnings multiple. That is the, probably the standard basic multiple that most people are, are, are relatively aware of. Um, so this is um, earnings. The, the increase in the price breaks down into, into two components generally. You either have EPS growth or you have increase in the PE multiple. Okay, EPS growth is what I call reality because it's usually an estimate within the next year or two years. Okay, so 2017 or 2018, that would be your increase in, in EPS growth. Your multiple is taking all of the cash flows way, way, way out in the future, and it's assuming if you have a rising multiple that all a lot of those cash flows in the future are going to be higher if you see the PE go up, those cash flows are probably they're expecting 15 years from now, 10 years, 5 years from now, that the cash flows are going to go up. So that's why PE is hope and EPS growth is reality because it's based in, it's usually estimates by analysts in the next one to two years. Okay, so the EPS growth slide here, reality. What happens in this model is we've got a price of 100 on the left hand side and we've got an EPS of 10, so the PE is 10 times. What happens if the price increases to, or the EPS increases to 20, let's say they, a company builds a new factory or it, and it's a surprise, people didn't know they would expand, suddenly the earnings estimates goes up to 20, but people expect that although this next year's earnings because of the new factory will jump from 10 to 20, the EPS rises, that the multiple long term for the company maybe is not going to increase that much. That the long-term growth prospects are about the same, although this year's earnings will be increased. The price, if we hold the multiple at 10 times, will go to 200. Um, so we have a doubling of price entirely based on an increase in the EPS, not based on the multiple. So no one's expecting any more future growth. The PE has stayed the same at 10 times, even while earnings has doubled. Okay, that's a reality-based growth. We like that. That's what we want. That would be the ideal scenario: is that we have an increase um, in earnings of 100%, but the PE stays stays the same. Okay, we know that's very fundamentally based in something we can see. New factory next year, we can trust those earnings. Now, the next slide is when we start into getting into hope. What I call hope. Okay, imagine the EPS hasn't changed. Um, for whatever reason, people are piling into stocks because generally people are euphoric about the markets, um, but this specific company maybe isn't really, obviously isn't really growing that much, their EPS is flat, um, or people are just 
um, bullish on a sector because another company in that sector has been doing well. So funds are flowing into it, even though our company is not really doing that well in terms of earnings. That's where you see the PE go from 10 times to 20 times. Like our previous example, the price goes from 100 to 200. But you notice there's no growth in the EPS, which to me means it's basically based on future, future hope that we're going to expect things way, way later on, not today, not based in EPS growth. Um, so these are the two things. And most price increases are based on a combination of these. Maybe you got a little bit of EPS growth of 10% and you've got a little bit of PE multiple. So people see the earnings growth grow this year and they expect that, oh, you know what, I bet you if earnings grow is good now, maybe two years, three years, five years, ten years, that's going to increase too. So the PE multiple also goes up. You have a combination of reality and hope, which I think is usually what happens and also um, I think that's reasonable when you're short-term APS grows up, growth goes up, maybe you think the PE multiple should go up too. That's fine. Now, where are we, though, in terms of these global markets? What's been driving um, this increase since 2016? Um, if we look at the next slide, the price to earnings, my hope slide, you can see that a lot of this price change has certainly been based on what I call hope. Um, so we've got an increase in the U.S. multiple from 15 times to 18, almost 19 times. Um, in the European multiple from 13, around 14 times to around 15 times currently. Uh, in Hong Kong, we've got an increase in, from 9 times to 12 times. So we've got a lot of hope in there. Now the question is, do we have a lot of reality to back this up? Do we have earnings growth, EPS growth for, let's say, I use 2017 EPS. Do we have a lot of earnings growth to back this up? Let's have a look. Next slide. No, we don't. EPS growth for the, uh, the SPX, this, the S&P 500, has actually, is basically flat since 2016. This is the 2017 estimate. So back at the beginning of 2000, January 2016, people had an estimate for this year's growth. And I'm showing how that has changed from the beginning of January until now. Um, European growth has actually been downgraded, mainly that's because people are concerned about the banks um, in, that, in that region, especially have seen major downgrades in their earnings. Hong Kong, same thing. Basically, earnings are flat. They actually took a dip into the end of, if you look at the, the, the way the chart moves from January 2016 to now, they actually are kind of flat, meaning it starts to dip, and then a lot of them have actually come out. So although it's not, it hasn't been flat all the way, there's actually quite a dip. Post the U.S. election, there's been a bit of a rebound as people think that, that growth can return. But got to remember, it, actually, the, the estimates have not really gone up um, since the beginning of last year. They're actually flat. So even after you take in all the upside from the election, there's not that much going on. Um, where are we historically in, on this hope ratio? Um, if we look at the next slide, the price to earnings slide, um, I think certainly for the U.S. we're in probably pretty dangerous territory. So the U.S. was 16 times P.E. in 2007, just before the last crash. Now we're at 19 times. So you could say that maybe there's still um, liquidity moving in and there's still um, some upside from the Trump trade, but what you can't say is that we're, we're cheap anymore. You can say that we're expensive and we're going to jump up more, we're going to get more expensive, people are getting excited about the market, you've got a lot of retail investors coming in, and I do admit that that, that can happen. And you can see these, even when you're already expensive, you can see in a bubble, you can see things go up further. But as a fundamental analyst at this point, the U.S., you really can't say that anything's cheap. So you're basing it on pretty much liquidity and assuming that someone, the next buyer, is going to be more excited than you are. In terms of actual growth, in terms of earnings, the reality of it is that not much is happening. There's a lot of hope. So now may be the time to be, in my opinion, especially on the U.S., to be a little bit more cautious. Europe, what you're seeing, um, they peaked out in, 19, in 2007 at 19 times P. They're at 17 times P. So a little bit um, cheaper, but also um, 
that region also has lower earnings expectations, especially because of their banks, and they don't have the, um, the big Trump push that you're seeing in the U.S. Um, the most interesting market is Hong Kong. Um, they peaked out at 19 times earnings, and now they're at um, 12 times. So 2007, their peak was almost 20, now they're at 12. So they're almost at half the levels they were at the peak. So when you look at Hong Kong, you're actually looking at some reasonable valuations. Now, some people would argue that part of the reasonableness of those valuations is because um, there's a heavy bank's weighting in the Hong Kong index and the Hang Seng index. And those banks are a lot of Chinese banks where it's... It's not clear how high the level of the non-performing loans in those banks are. So you can have a credit cycle turn quite quickly where loans start to go bad. When they do go bad, they tend to go bad quickly and people are pricing in um, just that happening, that, that the MPLs are much higher, the non-performing loans much higher than what's actually being reported. Um, having said that, it's still cheap. If you don't have a big turn in the credit cycle, and that might take some time to happen. Um, it could be another six months before we see anything like that. Um, but just to um, sum up where we're at, certainly S&P in Europe looking a little bit expensive, Hong Kong um, moderately, um, uh, moderately valued, not super expensive, um, but nowhere are we seeing super, super cheap assets. So what we want to do is we want to be relatively cautious um, and we want to start to see delivery on the earnings on the EPS we want to see those EPS not be flatter down we want to see that to start to come up to justify these valuations so until we see that we're gonna remain a bit cautious okay third third topic today sector rotation okay so this increase in the price that we've seen in these markets um, how is it, how is it bro broken down? I mean, is, is every single thing going up in the market evenly? How, what's been happening? If you look at the sector rotation chart, you can see that um, I haven't put every sector in there. Um, what this is is our um, at Asia Plus universe, which includes about 50% of the global market cap of the major developed markets. Um, so pretty representative of what's going on. What you can see is Huge rotation into banks, that's up 22% in the last six months. Materials, which is miners like um, Rio Tinto and BHP, you've seen a, a major um, move into materials, and which is commodity prices more than anything else. Um, the underperforming sectors are sectors like consumer staples, healthcare, and telecoms. All those have in common that they're quite defensive, so that when the market goes down, and people are less excited, there's more fear in the market, people tend to move to these sectors. So given that in the last six months it's been completely risk on, everyone's piling in, um, you've seen people completely ignore these sectors. We think that there's going to be maybe a reversal of that, especially with these interest rate rises. So we go back to the first thing we talked about. As these interest rates come up, maybe asset prices go down, especially if things that, that are cyclical like banks, commodities. And we've started to see that happen already. Bank, you know, We've seen Goldman Sachs has been down for eight days in a row. We've seen a lot of the commodity prices have started to, to, to turn, especially over the last month. Um, after a big run-up for uh, for at least three months, um, so we're we're suggesting that people look a little bit more to the downside. There's a lot of good stocks that you can um, that you can move into that people have definitely ignored over the last six months, like Staples Healthcare, especially telecoms. Um, so that is the uh, that sector rotation, and that's it for us uh, today. This has been uh, Global Talk, Graham Cunningham. Have a good day. Take care.